Hello, uh, I'm Michael Domian at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, I'm happy to welcome you to the class and uh, talk to you in this first uh, episode uh, about uh, the origins of the study of uh, learning and behavior. Uh, I'm going to talk about three intellectual roots for uh, uh, the study of contemporary uh, uh, research in uh, conditioning and learning. This all began, the first one and the oldest, uh, it all began with Charles Darwin. Now we know Charles Darwin uh, because he formulated the theory of evolution. And uh, his conception of evolution is not what has uh, turned out to be correct. We often think about Charles Darwin and survival of the fittest. Well, it's not the survival of the fittest that uh, <coughs> survives, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, the survival of the genes of those individuals who have the greatest number of progeny. Anyway, uh, that's not, neither here nor there. When uh, Darwin formulated his revolutionary concept of evolution. Uh, he based uh, this theory on observations of the physical characteristics of various species and animals, uh, uh, such as the shape of the beak of various species of birds. But when he get back to England after uh, collecting uh, information about the uh, shape and size <laughs> form of uh, various species of animals. Uh, and when he got back to England, tried to think about this, put this all together, it also occurred to him that uh, in addition to physical traits, psychological traits probably also undergo evolution. And in particular, he suggested that intelligence evolves. And so he raised the question of, well, how does intelligence evolve? And to begin to answer that question, you have to decide how are you how you're going to measure intelligence in various species of animals and darwin's suggestion was that intelligent behavior is behavior that is flexible and that can be modified with experience so in a sense uh, darwin defined uh, intelligence as the ability to learn which then put the study of learning in various species of animals at the center of uh, concerns about the evolution of intelligence. Now, at the time that Darwin uh, started thinking about these things, the only uh, evidence they had available were anecdotes about uh, clever things that animals did. Uh, since then, we've become a lot more sophisticated, and now we rely almost entirely on experimental studies of conditioning and learning. And we continue to be concerned about how this reflects uh, cognitive skills. Uh, the next slide shows you a list of the kinds of uh, cognitive skills that uh, psychologists have been, have, have and continue to study uh, uh, at the present time that are related to the issue of the evolution of intelligence. We don't, uh, call this uh, subject matter the evolution of intelligence anymore. We call it comparative cognition. And the psychologists are studying all kinds of things, including memory, concept formation, timing, same different judgments, tool making, uh, imitation, symbolic health, all sorts of, you'd be amazed at uh, the range of things that people study trying to understand uh, in the evolution of intelligence. All. Uh, stemming from the initial uh, work and, uh, and theoretical arguments of Charles Darwin. So that's the first intellectual root of the study of uh, conditioning and learning. The second intellectual root dates back to a guy who <laughs> came along a little bit after Darwin, uh, namely uh, Ivan Pavlov. If we may look at the next slide, Pavlov was with us uh, <clears throat> over the turn of the 20th century and he got a Nobel Prize uh, uh, in 1904 for his work on uh, digestive uh, physiology. We know him, of course, uh, primarily for his research on conditioned salivation. 
and much of uh, his work that uh, Americans are familiar with uh, is from a, the translation of a series of lectures that he gave uh, towards the end of his career that summarized a lot of the work on, uh, on conditioned salivation. And that uh, book uh, is titled The uh, Conditioned Reflexes, uh, published in 1927. What most people don't re think about, haven't bothered to look at, was what is the subtitle of that book? The subtitle of the book is An Investigation of the Physiological Activity of the Cerebral Cortex. So Pavlov was not interested in conditioned salivation because he was interested in learning or because he was interested in conditioning. He was interested in these things because uh, he, he considered uh, conditioning mechanisms to uh, uh, be mediated primarily by the cerebral cortex so that if you studied conditioning mechanisms, you would in a sense be understanding or learning about how the cerebral cortex works. Well, this was 19, uh, at the turn of the century, you know, 1904 or so. This uh, uh, general approach to studying the nervous system I call functional neurology. Uh, functional neurology doesn't involve actual measurements and, and uh, direct uh, uh, recordings of uh, brain activity or interventions in the brain and so on, but they involve studying the outputs of the brain, the outputs of the nervous system, and in order to better understand how the nervous system works. And of course, we've made a lot of progress since the days of uh, Pavlov in uh, uh, studying neural mechanisms using uh, much more direct uh, avenues of, of inquiry. But interestingly, the basic concept of functional neurology is still very much with us today. The next slide shows you a, a picture of Eric Kandel. Now, Eric Kandel is also studying uh, conditioning and associations. Uh, he's studying these things at a much more molecular level where he can uh, directly observe exactly what's going on at synapses and uh, uh, neural membrane junctions and so forth. And, uh, and he won the Nobel Prize as well in the year 2000, about 100 years after uh, Pavlov. And uh, he's a very prominent neuroscientist who put together a, a compendium of knowledge of neuroscience, as we just call it, the principles of neuroscience. It's a huge book that goes over a thousand pages. And uh, in the introduction to that book, he's, he writes that the central tenet of modern neuroscience is that all behavior is a reflection of brain function. And that is exactly the sentiment that motivated Pavlov's work. So functional neurology remains very much with us today. Okay, now the third um, source of uh, motivation for doing studies of conditioning and learning, particularly in animals, is provided uh, by, uh, show, uh, uh, highlighted in the next slide, uh, the effort here is to uh, create animal models of human behavior. And uh, we don't always think about this, but actually B.F. Skinner, B.F. Skinner is one of the more famous psychologists. If you, if you ask undergraduates who are famous psychologists, they'll say Freud, <laughs> and uh, they'll say B.F. Skinner. Now much of what Freud talked about is not contemporary psychology, <clears throat> but uh, a lot of what Skinner talked about, you know, psychologists can still continue to uh, pay a lot of attention to. And uh, Skinner did lots of experiments with rats uh, that, uh, that resulted in a book uh, that summarized those findings in 1938. And then he did a lot of pigeon experiments and resulted in a huge uh, volume that was published in 1957. Uh, lots of empirical data, animal laboratory. But he was always keenly interested in how you could apply this to the, improve the human condition. And he wrote about that in 1948 in a book that uh, was called Walden II, in which he tried to describe what a utopian society would be like 
if the, this society were organized around the principles of conditioning and learning. So as early as 1948, uh, he was looking to uh, apply the findings from animal laboratories to uh, improve the human conditioning. And he wrote, continued to write about that uh, to the rest of his career. And, and there's a major uh, uh, professional effort to uh, use uh, uh, Skinnerian principles to uh, uh, modify and help people with various disorders, uh, which is called applied behavior analysis. There is a large international society. People be can become trained as applied behavior analysts and uh, they can get certification. And uh, these folks uh, deal with all kinds of behavioral problems, often in children, but sometimes as late as, uh, uh, you know, high school kids and uh, early adults. Uh, they deal with the autism spectrum disorder. They deal with very developmental disorders and so on. And all of that represents uh, an application to uh, human behavior of uh, principles that were initially developed uh, in animal laboratories. The next slide uh, uh, shows a list of, uh, a partial list of uh, areas in which animal research and conditioning has been uh, used to better understand human problems. Uh, acquisition of fears, phobias, and post-traumatic stress disorder uh, has been heavily guided by animal research or treatment of fears and phobias in people originates uh, with much of animal research. Of course, drug uh, development and, uh, and uh, research on drug tolerance has a lot of animal work, drug uh, tactics for development of uh, treatment of drug abuse is often based on animal research. Uh, already mentioned uh, uh, autism spectrum disorder. There are lots of medical applications and an area of application that you might not have thought about is robotics and artificial intelligence. In fact, last year in Bloomberg uh, Business Week, I saw a headline which read, Apple, Google, and Facebook are raiding animal research labs. And the subtitle says, neuroscientists studying birds, mice, and fish are landing seven-figure salaries to help advance artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, and more. So to the extent that uh, research on conditioning and learning is telling us about the evolution of cognition and how cognition works in animal systems, well, cognition, people who are interested in artificial intelligence and uh, artificial cognitive systems uh, looking to this research in order to shape and um, create more effective artificial intelligence systems. So the next time somebody tells you that conditioning and learning is all that and who cares and nobody needs to know about that anymore, <laughs> you ask them, when's the last time you got a job offer from Google and Facebook because you knew the basics of uh, conditioning and learning. That's my story for today. That's the story of the semester. And I hope you will enjoy the course. Thank you very much.